welcome to this AV Land review of the Onkyo TX NR626 home cinema receiver. We're going to talk you through the different features of this receiver, uh, a little bit about how to set it up, show you its menus, its networking features, and most importantly, we're going to tell you what we think it sounds like and what it's like to use. So the 626 from Onkyo is the latest in a long line of receivers uh, with, which start with a 6, TXNR6. Uh, last year's model was the TXNR616 and this is the re direct replacement for it. Now, a few things have uh, been taken off from last year's model. Uh, most notably, this is no longer THX Select. There's a few things to do with the sort of look at it and build of it. Uh, last year's model had like a, a, an illumination around the um, volume control. That's gone. But they've added a few things. So on last year's 616 model, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi were optional USB dongles that you had to plug in to the USB socket. Now they're actually built into the unit. So you don't have to pay any extra for those. And the price has come down slightly as well from last year's model. So though it isn't THX Select, it, is, it, it does have other things that, are, that benefit it. It also has a phono input, uh, which at this price point is fairly unique. There aren't any other AV receivers that we know of that have a, a record player input. Again, you have to buy an optional phono stage. So if you have got a record player, uh, that, that is quite useful. So it has Dolby True HD, DTS HD, Odyssey Multi EQ. It has a 4K audio uh, upscaler to 4K, uh, and it has six HDMI inputs. It still has a built-in uh, tuner uh, that you can use, FM and AM. And as you can see there from those logos, it has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. The Bluetooth is particularly useful because what it means you can do is if you've got a, a tablet or a phone that has music on and you just want some background music, you can stream it straight to this. Anything you've got, maybe you, maybe you want to listen to Spotify or something like that on, that's actually on your tablet or your phone, you can do that without using the Spotify that's built into the unit because, of course, you can do it that way too. Now, it has, as well as having the six HDMI inputs, it also has twin HDMI outputs, which is quite useful if you have a projector and uh, a television in the same room. It has a pure audio mode that disables things like the front panel and, and makes it uh, switch off unnecessary things. Uh, the front display goes off and uh, makes it sound a lot better uh, for just straight stereo listening, just for music. Um, so we'd recommend doing that if, you, if you're just using it to play back CDs. Now here, here on the back panel, uh, it's for the price, it's got quite a lot of connections. You can see there, it has the six HDMI inputs on the back panel. There's the wired Ethernet connection, which you can still use. You don't have to use the Wi-Fi if you don't want to. Two co coaxial uh, digital inputs, as well as an optical. The phono stage. A few analog inputs, a component video input, which it will up convert that component signal and those composite signals up to HDMI. So if you've got something like an older Xbox or a Wii that you want to plug in there, you can then output just the one cable to your television. Now the binding post at the back, they can be used in a multitude of different ways. We always, always recommend using banana plugs. It's a tidier connection than using uh, bare wire, less likely to corrode and, and less likely to short out and touch each other. Uh, and just a lot easier to set up. If you've already got banana plugs on, you just plug it in like that. It's very, very simple. There are these little plastic bungs, which we showed you there with a screw, you can just prise out. You can use it to bare wire as well if you wish. Uh, but it can become quite a tangle with all the cables coming out of the side. So you have to unscrew the terminal like this, and then you have to plug it into the side, goes into the side of the connection like that. But you can see it can become, you see all the, all the strands coming apart. Now we're going to take the lid off the Onkyo TX and our 626 home cinema receiver, show you the components inside, and then just a general look around it. So this is what's under the lid. You can see that really large cooling fan. This main green board here that we can see is the main brains of the amplifier. All the decoding is on there. The HDMI sockets are on there as well. So all the HDMI video switching is all on that board. Uh, the, all the DSP processing, that sort of thing is all done on this one huge great big board. Um, there are boards below that as well. And to the left of that you can just see there the amplification modules of which it has seven. That's the power supply. It's quite a chunky, big, big power supply. Um, that converts all the all the, the the mains voltage coming in to lower voltages used for different parts of the amplifier and, of course, the amplification. You've got a big 
uh, heat sink there and all the little actual amps are uh, attached to that the actual amplification op amp modules that's the wi-fi uh, and bluetooth card we believe that's the where where it does all the all the rf signals for that uh, and here's all the amps you can see it's got two of those little uh, uh, modules per channel of amplification so there's 14 of them in total for all seven amps and then here's more of the amplification boards with those bits coming out sideways so those little orange things on the top to adjust each volume now here's the setup menus they've had this this sort of design for a few years here you can see for HDMI you can change the output resolution have it auto or you can just pass through what's coming in you can flip the monitor out it doesn't do this GUI on both um, both of the HDMI's it only does the does it on one of them it defaults to do it on the main output but if you want to you can have it on the sub uh, the sub output is simultaneous but it just passes through literally what's coming in uh, you know whether it's blu-ray or wh whichever input you're on you can reassign the different inputs to different you know different connections to different inputs so uh, here you do the audio for coaxial and optical uh, assign it to a different input uh, that's useful if you've got an older sky box for example here in the UK that doesn't output Dolby Digital uh, down HDMI, although the newer boxes now can do with an update, will help put Dolby Digital down HDMI, so you only need the HDMI cable. Into the speaker settings menu, and here you can change the uh, speaker impedance. Um, defaults to 6 ohms, that covers most things, whether it's 8 or 6 ohm speakers, most are around the 6 ohm mark. You can buy amp the front channels if you're only using uh, it for 5.0. Uh, 2 or 5.1 you're only using five of the amps you can use the extra two amps to send separate treble and bass well, though the signals are the same to to this to the speakers doubling up on the amplification for your front speakers in the speaker configuration you can set it whether you're using satellite speakers or very small speakers and you can cut the frequencies off at a certain point and it will then send those frequencies to the subwoofer if you hit full band it sends the, the lot to the front speakers that's what I'd recommend if you've got anything like a normal sort of hi-fi speaker, even a bookshelf speaker and a larger center speaker. I'd only set it to being a smaller option if you literally are using a subsat system. You can set the frequency there for the subwoofer as well. Here you set the different distances up from, from where you're sitting mainly uh, to the to the speaker positions. Quite useful if your room isn't a normal sort of shape, if, if you haven't got it in a, in a sort of square configuration like the diagram here shows, if it's slightly, there's some speakers slightly away from the other, you can adjust all that sort of thing. Here's where you set the levels, same sort of thing. If you've got the, um, the speaker slightly further away, uh, you, you're gonna wanna boost the uh, level of say the left channel if that's further away. Now the Odyssey setup, it does do all of this. It, it does this for you. Um, we always set up amplifiers manually. We don't use the Odyssey setup, but give it a try. See what you prefer. Um, we always recommend trying both things. Here's some different settings for the different sound formats. So for Dolby Digital, for DTS, ProLogic, you can adjust the different, various different things here in, the, in, the, in these menus. The Odyssey is uh, greyed out there, but if the Odyssey had been set up, you can go in there and tweak the Odyssey and, and redo the Odyssey if the front microphone is plugged in. Here's where you can adjust the delay between the video and the audio. So if you've got a TV that adds uh, some delay to it, to the sound, uh, uh, to the picture rather, you can delay the sound to marry up with that. You can rename the input, so if you want it to say Xbox or Sky or you know, whatever you want, you can make it more convenient to change uh, inputs so it makes more sense. Here's where you can decide whether you want the audio to be on HDMI or analog. You can set up here different presets for each input. So if you always want it to go to what it was last on, you leave it on last uh, valid or you can set it for different for different types of signals coming through you can set it to do a certain thing a certain sound mode you can do that for all the different uh, inputs on the amplifier here you can restrict the uh, volume so it can't be turned up too loud because you can blow up any amp with any speakers uh, and vice versa you can damage the amp and the speakers so it's always Always good if you if you if you've maybe if you've got uh, young children using the receiver to limit what volume it can go up to. The 
some more HDMI settings here. You can turn the CEC control off. Um, now we find this quite problematic with most televisions. Uh, it doesn't always work how you expect. It can cause other problems as well. You can tell it to pass through the audio when the amp's turned off to the TV. So if you just want the sound from your different inputs, like your Blu-ray player to come out of the television, you can get it to do that as well. It defaults to turn itself off if it doesn't receive a signal. Uh, after a certain period of time, you can turn that off. And here you go, you can pass through the, the HDMI again through to the television when, when, it's, when it's turned off. The networking here, you can go in and manually configure an IP address or you can get it to pick one up from your router. Uh, if you're having any kind of network problems, we recommend trying to fix the IP address to a static one. That does solve a lot of problems. You can um, go through the initial pro uh, setup process, which it does when you first plug the unit in. You can go through it again if you've skipped it or, or just want to reset the whole thing. You can do that there in that initial setup menu. You can have more than one of these units in the room uh, and have the, the remote controls uh, on different codes. So if you've got three of them, for some reason, maybe you've got a, a multi-room system or and they're all in one place, you can have them configured differently. Now, this is quite clever on the remote control it actually will receive a signal back from the amplifier and the amplifier has a database of different manufacturers codes so if you've got a Panasonic television you can go in there you can find the codes for your uh, television and it will send them back to the remote for you to try out if it works if it turns your TV off or does it control like the volume on your on your television you can say yep yeah, that's my remote control and it will then teach the remote control the codes for your television and, and other devices as well so fully functional uh, learning uh, well, pre-programmed remote control. Now these, this is a different menu. This is, how, that's, this is the menu where you actually go into the setup menu and also where you view the Insta preview. This shows you different uh, what's going through different inputs. Um, now, the capture card that we are using to get this is a bit, uh, is a bit slow. So that's why the actual video at the back here is a bit juddery. Uh, you wouldn't normally get that through it. However, it does only show you a few frames at a time on each of the thumbnails for the different inputs. So they, they are normally like that. Uh, and you can see that we've got an Xbox here, a PlayStation, and another, another source playing video. Uh, that it's quite useful that it shows you uh, what's going on. There are other options in here. You can update the firmware. You can go straight to the networking. Or you can go to USB. Here in the, uh, this, this, this button is marked up as Q on the remote control. You can go and see various different things. Again, you can see a thumbnail of the video input that's coming in. You can see what sort of signals coming in on each input. And if you go into these other separate menus just below for audio and video, it gives you the options to change things. So you can change the bass, the treble, subwoofer level, all that kind of thing very quickly without having to go into the full setup menu. You do the same for video. It has various different video presets in it to adjust the video. We recommend having it on auto and just passing through the video as it is. We wouldn't use the video processing it, but it's there if you want. You might have an older analog source that benefits. Here it shows you the actual detail of the video signal going, uh, coming in and both going out to the television. So you can see exactly what's going on. Uh, you can see exactly what audio formats coming in, uh, what frequency it is, uh, what bit rate, all that kind of thing. All that sort of information is there. It shows you, uh, you know, what's what's going on. You can change the listening mode here as well. So if you want it all channel stereo, ProLogic Two, that can all be done via this menu. In the networking menu, you have a variety of different options. These are updatable by Ankyo in the future, so they can add more things. This is their new. Uh, they use TuneIn now for their uh, um, internet radio. Uh, they used to use VTuner, but they've moved away from that. But it, functionality wise, it's very, very similar. You can go through, you can list stations by country, by genre, all kinds of different things, ways of finding different radio stations. It, it, it loads fairly quickly. You click in there, it's, you can see it started playing. And then after a few seconds, it will bring up, it depends on the radio station. Sometimes they show a picture of the DJ like they do here, or they might show the album art for what's playing, or just the station's logo. You can see here in the UK, not only have you got the national commercial stations, but you have 
all of the BBC stations, including their local stations, are available on here. So there's an awful lot of different things you can uh, you can listen to. So onto Spotify. Uh, this has Spotify built in. You need a Spotify premium account, which uh, currently you have to pay for each month in order to use this feature. It doesn't work with just the standard Spotify account. There's various different ways you can find new music. Uh, but the way you're probably going to do it the most is to search. You can do this via their app as well. You don't have to do it just uh, on this uh, on-screen keyboard. Um, but this is this is quite quite uh, quite a quick way of, of finding music you want to listen to. So here we've searched for ABBA, and it just basically brings up as much ABBA as you could possibly ever want. You can see that there's uh, 99 tracks uh, that it's brought up. Uh, click straight on it, it'll start streaming that music across the internet pretty quick. And then just like with the internet radio, it will also bring up some album art. The, the album art's also shown on their, uh, uh, their apps for iOS and for Android. Here you can just find some some just random music. It will show you new music and that sort of thing. This is the home media menu. Uh, we're just showing you here briefly down on the on the bottom left. You can also do all this from the front display. You don't actually even need to have the television on. Uh, you don't have to be using an app. You can do it on the front display. That's we've superimposed the, the front display over the, over this. So here, we're browsing some FLAC files. It'll play FLAC twenty four bit one nine two. The home media function is very useful because you don't actually need to be running a DLNA server. You can just be using a shared network drive or a NAS drive that doesn't support DLNA, and you can browse uh, your music there. The added advantage of this is currently we only know of one DLNA server on the market that will do copied SACD disks uh, as DSD files that will actually serve them up over DLNA. And so the only real way to do it with most DLNA drives, you can't do it. You've got to use something like this home media function, which uh, uses a Samba networks drive. You can actually play back uh, DSD files as well as FLAC. WAV, MP3, Winners Media Audio. You know, it does an awful lot of different um, music formats and it does them all as high resolution tracks as well if you've got uh, files you've downloaded. Um, it's quite easy to um, play them back using this if you've got them organized nicely in, in, in folders, uh, whereas DLNA organizes them for you by genre and that sort of thing. This doesn't. This is just literally how you've copied them into the folders. But here you can see it playing back uh, a DSD file uses all the same sort of navigational logic as uh, as with the internet radio and if you're if you're playing back off a USB stick it would look pretty similar to this as well it's just how the how the folders how you've structured them So this is the DLNA menu, and if you've got your got files shared using a NAS drive or um, you've got a computer that does DLNA, this will serve up uh, various different types of music. It's heavily dependent on what your NAS drive or your DLNA server can actually do. Um, so the one we're doing is quite good. It does WAV files, it does FLAC, it does MP3, it does Windows Media Audio. Some on the market, they'll only do Windows Media Audio and MP3. Some of them will do WAV but not FLAC and vice versa. So um, it, it's not dependent on what... The, basically, as, as from what we've tested, the Onkia will play it if the DLNA server will offer it up. Um, but, you know, it, it isn't the Onkyo that's the problem. It, in Most of the time it is the, the NAS driver or, or DLNA server on your computer. For example, Windows, it doesn't share... Uh, in the versions of Windows we've tried it with, it doesn't sh share WAV files. It's got no way of doing it, no way of organising the names. Whereas the NAS drive that we use, it, it looks at the um, the file name 
and the folder to look at what the artist is and what the uh, uh, track title is um, but it can also browse by folders and that's the crucial thing not all of them let you do that this is the Onkyo app and uh, we're showing you the Android version but the Apple version is very very similar now it hasn't changed much uh, from last year's app the look of it's still the same there's still a problem with it at the bottom where you can't actually uh, access the volume on this tablet that we're using it does work on other tablets but we have problems with it it's still also fundamentally designed for a phone size screen so if you're using it we're, we're using it with a nine inch or a seven inch tablet it's way too big you know they could all these inputs could be in one place the main things they have added is you've got Bluetooth there um, as standard as an input, but uh, it hasn't really changed much from last year's. It will do some basic controls of a uh, Blu-ray player using CC um, if it's connected down the HDMI like that. Uh, but it is so long winded to use that we probably don't recommend bother bothering with it. The main function of here that is quite useful is this net function in that it's a little bit easier to navigate than actually using the remote control. So for instance, if you want to go to Spotify, uh, it's just a little bit more slick uh, to use, but still, I mean, there's only four options there. That, you know, the, on a on a full size tablet, that's huge. Um, it seems to load slightly quicker than maybe it does on the actual receiver, but there isn't much in it really. Um, it it could be so much better designed than it is, um, and and really, it needs it needs something that's designed for a tablet because I imagine that that's how most people intend to use it. They don't intend to use it on a phone. Uh, they may only use it on a phone if they're maybe using the Zone 2 ability of this receiver because you can use the 6th and 7th amps uh, for a, a secondary zone. So you can browse all the same things as we showed you uh, using its set menus. You can browse your NAS drive using DLNA. Um, and it is more convenient than, especially if you want to turn the screen off, you turn your television or projector off, you can just look at your tablet. but it could be better designed. It's, it's, it is a bit sort of uh, long-winded to, to change anything. Just the basic control of the amp is very poor, we find. Just bring the amp back, although, as you can see on a larger tablet, very low res, so when it's scaled, it doesn't look very good at all. Um, I don't know if that's the receiver that's sending that back in poor quality or it's their app interpreting it. Um, but um, here you can see that's how you get the setup menus. You can adjust the treble and bass, but it's all very big. Now, there is an alternative. This is my AV. This works with a variety of different receivers, including the 626. We've tested it with it. And you can see here, this is designed for a tablet. It's not designed for a mobile phone. It's, you have all your controls uh, that you're going to use most of the time in one place. You can quickly change input, so you change over to Blu-ray. You can quickly change the different input modes, so if you want to switch it to stereo. It automatically finds the amplifiers on your network, so uh, whether they're uh, Onkyo or uh, you know, Denon, Marantz, Pioneer, Yamaha. This works with, with a multitude of different receivers. Uh, and you don't have to keep going through different screens and menus, it's all there. The volume controls are nice and big. Uh, it's not a slider, so you can't suddenly make the volume go up to ridiculously loud, which you do with a slider. You can just, just as you would with the right control, go up and down. Uh, and you can scroll along and, and, and access a lot more inputs. Also, crucially, it will control other components, like your television or Skybox or Virgin Box. It, it does all that sort of thing all in one place, keeping the controls around the outside for your AV receiver. So you want to change channels, you can do that, but you can also uh, make the volume go up and down. It also brings a lot of feedback, so it shows you the, the what's coming in, the video input and the audio input. All, to, all round, all together, much, much better than using the manufacturer's app. Now on to the pros and cons. First, let's start with the pros. It's the only receiver we know of uh, at the moment that, that has both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in as standard at this price point. Uh, there are a few on the market that have Wi-Fi built in, but... Uh, to have both is very useful, it means there's no hidden extras if you want to use it in that way. A lot of people assume it's got that in built in anyway. It it has very good build quality as well for its price point. And sound wise, this is where it gets really interesting. Onky have managed to improve even slightly more on last year's sound. It's a bit more refined, it's got a bit more punch. It it's drives a multitude of different speakers as well. We've tested it with a few different ones very easily, even quite expensive speakers. We tested it out with some uh, some quite expensive Carefloud speakers and it worked very well. Um, no THX Select on it this year, but 
a lot of what you're paying for with THX is just this, you know, the certification process. Uh, actual, what it adds is, is in, in terms of sound quality isn't necessarily that great. So we think that they've managed to pack in quite a lot for, for quite a budget price. On the con side, well, you can say that it doesn't have THX like last year's. There's a few little uh, build quality things that are slightly different from last year, but for the money, we really can't complain. All the other manufacturers at this price point have a plastic front panel, and this looks better than it, than those. It, it, it looks more more refined and, and, and better quality than the, the other people's uh, amps. Uh, on the, the the other thing we have to say on the con side, of course, we've just been talking about is the app. The app really, really could be so much better. But it's good to see now that there are alternatives like the MyAV control. Uh, we'll be doing a full review of that soon as well, so you'll be able to see what that's uh, like in, in, a, in, a, in a lot better detail. Uh, we like, uh, we also like on the pro side that it's got a phono stage. Um, not going to be useful for everyone, but it's, again, unusual at this price point. The home media function as well on the pro, pro side, very useful, unique, that you can just browse uh, network folders at your leisure. Uh, we really, really like that. We think that's a really good feature. That's the end of our review of the Onkyo TXNR626. If you've enjoyed this view and you'd like to see more, we have more of them on our YouTube feed, which you can access through our website, avland.co.uk. The unit's also available to purchase on. Thank you. Yeah.